see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. And today I'm here with uh, Dara Feldman. And uh, Dara, I have your, uh, the, your description from the Ashoka website where you and I are uh, expert commentators on the Ashoka contest for uh, creating empathy in the schools for best practices. And there, your description says, Dara Feldman is Director of Education and Master Facilitator for the Virtues Project. And you're offering keynote workshops and retreats, uh, transforming school culture and empowering students, educators, and families to thrive. Uh, is there something else you'd like to uh, describe about your background, Dara? Well, basically, I spent the majority of my career as a frontline educator, very passionate about education. I taught um, pre-K all the way to fourth grade. I was also a technology specialist for five years and really focused on utilizing technology to enhance balanced literacy. And then in 2005, I was blessed as Disney's elementary teacher of the year. And that's how I found out about the Virtues Project. And it was... Um, exactly why I went into education to begin with in just five simple strategies. So after um, learning about the Virtues Project and realizing that there are other educators who could benefit from knowing about it, I left. I did a little bit of coaching teachers and have been doing professional development around the Virtues Project ever since. Well, as I mentioned, you and I are both expert commentators on the Ashoka yeah, the expert. I know somebody else I talked to. They said, oh, "I don't like that word, expert," because you know. But, but anyway, that's what they call us. And and uh, so it's really their their project is about empathy in the schools. How do we promote and develop and foster empathy in the schools? And that's also what uh, you know. My work is around is how do we do it? It it kind of a societal level. And so that's kind of what we wanted to talk about was how does your work. Uh, foster and nurture empathy in you know in society as well as you know specifically in the schools well first before i answer that and when i just really want to honor your commitment to making the importance of empathy visible to all of humanity because it is an essential virtue absolutely and as you know um it's something that we're all born with we're all born actually with all of the virtues innocent potential but we are like pre-wired for empathy. And um, what I've noticed as students progress in their age throughout school, they get a little empathy amnesia. And I don't really think it's because of them, but I think it's the situations that we put them in and that we're not, we have not traditionally, at least of late, been nurturing the whole child. And so these young children, when I was teaching kindergarten, they had empathy, huge amounts of empathy. But I think as um, time progresses, it gets squished or it's not um, given an opportunity to be strengthened because it's not acknowledged. So the work that we do in the Virtues Project, the first strategy is speaking the language of the virtues. And when we can give an acknowledgement very specific to use the stem, I see, I honor, I want to acknowledge, and then a particular virtue such as empathy, and then the example of how they're demonstrating that empathy, then that's a way to really hold up a mirror to a child or to another adult to say, I see you. I really see you and your empathy. And, and this is what it looks like. And so, for example, an acknowledgement for empathy might be, um, well, you know what? I really want to acknowledge your empathy in the way that you um, put your arm around your buddy when you looked, when they look like they were sad you know I could tell that you were really coming from that place of empathy and so that's letting the child know through a context clue that oh this is one way that empathy might look like and then um, we also use the language to guide and correct and to bring people back to a virtue never to shame or blame but to recognize that teachable moment so it might be in a guidance situation, letting kids know that they're gonna, it would be beneficial for them to call on the empathy card. Perhaps we're getting a new student 
And we might say, okay, guys, I want everybody to think about and use their empathy right now. If we apply empathy, what do you think the student might be thinking or feeling? And how can we make our classroom community a warm and inviting place? And having that discussion. And then on the correction side, once there's been a mistaken behavior, again, not shaming or blaming, just calling somebody back to empathy, saying, okay, you know what, um, there's been harm. If you were going to call on empathy, knowing that that child has just had a really hard situation, what would your behavior look like instead? And how can you make amends? So that's just the first strategy applied to using the, the virtue of empathy. Yeah, so uh, from what I've just learned about empathy is that it helps to, as we kind of articulate our own feelings, that we can uh, deepen empathy through that, it's kind of for that self-empathy, you know, that sensory awareness of what's going on within ourselves, and then being able to put the vocabulary to that, to express it, to share with others, so others can see who we are. And it seems that the kind of you have a strategy for doing that, for naming those uh, feelings that are within ourselves and then starting to see the feelings in others and having a vocabulary. Uh, well, yes, I mean, it, and it's beyond the feelings. It's the virtues. And so oftentimes people bring a lot of baggage to the word virtues. They might think it has religious connotations. They might attribute it to a certain political party or to a certain person, um, think it's, you know, moralistic, etc. But for us in the Virtues Project, the definition of virtues are universal positive qualities of character. And they're agreed upon by all cultures of all of humanity. And so what I've been learning is um, that these individual virtues like empathy, compassion, kindness, respect, responsibility, trustworthiness, integrity, etc., that not only are they virtues, great vocabulary words, but they actually are transferable skills. And when we know what they mean, and how to put them in practice, then we're able to apply them to different situations and scenarios. So it's not just, oh, you know, be nice to your brother or share your toys. It's, you know, this is what kindness looks like. This is what generosity looks like. So the next time that I have the opportunity to be generous, I know that it might mean giving a little bit or something that maybe I don't really want to give, but I'm going to be because I'm generous. So it becomes an applied skill. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the uh, each of those virtues has a skill set around it, and by learning about the virtues, you learn the skill of how to manifest that uh, well, virtue, so, is that? You know, there's, there's some beautiful definitions, and then may I actually share yeah, the Yeah, that would be great. Uh -huh. So as you know, um, these are the Virtues Reflection Cards, and there are 100 in the set. In the Educator's Cards, there's 52, also in the Family Deck. But um, let me read the Empathy Card. You can also access all of the cards and to do a random pick on our website. Is it okay if I give out the URL? Uh, yeah, please do. Okay, so it's virtuesproject.org. V-I-R-T-U-E-S-P-R-O-J-E-C-T dot org. And on the home page, it, it'll say, you know, do a pick. And that will be these kinds of cards. These are the reflection cards. If you're an educator and you want to get to the cards that are um, kosher for public school use, click on educator and then you'll see cards that look like this. But for now, I'm going to read the empathy card. Empathy is the ability to put ourselves in another's place and to understand their experience. We are deeply present to their thoughts and feelings with such compassionate accuracy that they can hear their own thoughts more clearly. Empathy connects us with our common humanity. It protects us from prejudice, blame, and judgment, those things that divide us from one another. With empathy, we reflect on how actions affect others. It moves us to seek justice for every person, even those with whom we disagree. Empathy inspires us to be giving and selfless. Empathy connects our hearts. And then on the back of each of the cards, there's a quote. And I love this quote, one of my favorites. To listen another soul into a condition of disclosure and discovery 
may be almost the greatest service any human being ever performs for another. And that's by Douglas Steer. And then there's some affirmations. So the practice of empathy. I seek to understand others' experience. I listen with compassion. I refrain from judging and blaming. I think about how my choices impact others. I care about people's rights. I feel my connection to all people. I am thankful for the gift of empathy. It sensitizes my heart. So Edwin, how did our definition resonate with you and, and did it make you think or feel anything? Yeah, the uh, well, I've, I've looked at empathy so much, so I have a whole scheme, you know, I've worked out for definitions. Uh, but I think that really resonates. I think it's nice to, it feels good to bring in, you know, the quotes and, and kind of the explanation and it creates a whole kind of a context uh, for mm. empathy. So I think that I find it very helpful. Also, you had emailed me that when you sent me the email uh when we were emailing, lining up this uh, this uh, discussion, uh, you'd sent it as a as a image, and it was really beautiful. I mean, I just really enjoyed. I mean, uh, just seeing it. So, well, thank you for your openness to our definition and also your enthusiasm for the cards. I love to send um, really specific virtues to people in my email correspondence. So it's often a strength virtue. And clearly, since right now it seems like your whole life revolves around empathy, that's got to be one of your strength virtues. And I don't mean to um, turn the tables on our interview, but I am curious as to what got you so focused on the virtue of empathy, if you don't mind sharing. Oh, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, I mean, it depends. There's like a long story, long story, and a sh short story. This is but, your interview, Dave. <laughs> so you get to pick it. But I have a website actually called humanityquest.com. It has a list of 500 values on it, so I, it kind of resonates with with the work that you're doing. Because I've always been interested in uh, thematically looking at values, mm -hmm. uh, like just like you're doing. You have a list of I don't know how many, like a hundred or something, right? right. Virtues. So that's kind of been a, a natural tendency from my of me too, and to to thematically look at take one and kind of dig into it and explore it. And I was doing that and doing some video projects around it. And then I started asking people about well, what are progressive values? Because the conservatives were talking a lot about uh, about uh, conservative values. And people would talk about caring, like the value of caring. And I'd say, well, tell me a story of how caring became important to you. And their eyes, you know, they would start tearing mm -hmm. up, recounting these stories about why these values were important to them. And it kind of led me to the importance of empathy as this foundational value that, uh, you know, caring to care for others. We need to uh, have empathy. You know, we have empathy and then the caring kind of develops and, and the more I got into it and started doing, you know, empathy training, I said, wow, this is what I've really been about myself. Wow. This value of empathy, I, I just never really used the word that much. And the more I got into it, I said, well, this time in, in history, I really feel that we need uh, to change the culture, to raise the value of empathy within society, because that's how we connect and and it's like how problems and conflicts are, are resolved and and you know how we are heard i you know learning about the importance of being heard how important it is that everyone can kind of be heard by others and mm -hmm. and how and so you know kind of i could go on and on but uh, that's kind of the, the basics of it and and now i'm kind of just looking with through these interviews to find out what other insights kind of it's a bit of a quest so how what's this what 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 the what insights, uh, you know, do you have that can raise the value of empathy, you know, within your life, within the school culture and within the culture in general? Wow. I, I don't think I've ever met somebody with so much enthusiasm <laughs> and empathy or maybe enthusiasm for empathy. But it, I agree with you. Um, it is so incredibly important right now. And um, when we can put ourselves into another's, you know, just connect with their hearts or to put ourselves in their shoes, so to speak, um, as a metaphor, then I think that that's um, when true understanding can happen. And it can certainly prevent some of the conflicts that are happening. 
Yeah, and you, wait, you just mentioned metaphor, and we talked about this earlier that you had a metaphor for empathy that was your own personal metaphor that was a mirror, I believe. Was, was yeah, I think a, a mirror of the soul. You know, when we can really mirror someone else's soul and ha have a window. I think it was a window, not so much a mirror, but really a window and look into another person's soul to see the intention behind the behavior or what's going on with them, then I think that it is something that then empathy can be used as a catalyst for real positive, you know, positive experience. Okay, because, so, oh, so uh, empathy is like a, a, a window. So as we're, I'm looking at you right now uh, through Skype and I have two windows up. And so empathy is kind of like this window that I'm able to see you. Uh, well, see me, but, but a window into my soul. Because there's really different because, you know, maybe I'm like this talking to you and if you're not coming from a place of empathy in your head, you might be judging me or thinking a whole bunch of other things. But if you knew that I was up until, you know, five o'clock in the morning studying everything that I could about empathy to prepare for this interview, don't worry, that was not the case. Um then perhaps you would say, oh, wow, you know, Dara, what's this about? You look really tired instead of, well, and she rude sitting there looking all bored during my interview or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's a window into a deeper uh, part of, of, you, of the other person. It's not just looking at the surface. It's getting uh, deeper into the soul and, and not uh, maybe having sometimes uh, – you know, I ask about uh, blocks to empathy and judgment mm. uh, can be a, a block, something that gets between us, you know, me judging you, good, bad, you know, Absolutely. in between. So it's like you're kind of taking that block away and able to move through the window to see deeper into the other. Yeah, that, you know, that's an excellent point. Sometimes in order for us to understand what a, a particular virtue is, we need to understand what it's not or what blocks us. And so when um, we come from that place of judgment, we're looking for differences. We're looking to separate ourselves from another person. And I think that the virtue of empathy is the total opposite, where we're really looking to see what our commonalities are so that we have an understanding of that other person. Mm -hmm. Is so, that what yeah, you thought? It's, it's the commonality, seeing how we are the same and, and kind of getting, putting away the judgments. Exactly. Kind of, uh-huh. And so how do we remove those judgments and kind of how do we kind of have that deeper uh, connection then with others? Well, I, I think that's where the virtues come in flocks, um, as the founders would say, and that in order to be able to access the virtue of empathy, there are other virtues that people need to call on. And one is mindfulness. And so when we're really mindful of somebody else and mindful of our own thoughts and feelings, then we can do some, you know, metacognition and go, what's really happening with me? My buttons are being pushed. Is this person that evil or is it something from my childhood? You know, oh, they're just really stressed out because no child left behind. I get it. And then the empathy can kick in. So it might be mindfulness. Um, it could be, um, discernment, just going through and trying to, to think clearly, purposefulness. There are a bunch of different virtues. And I think you, we can't say it's just these qualities of character at this time. I think it's dependent on the situation. And I think it's dependent on the interaction. Who's on the other side of your possible empathy? You know, you may have, for me, I have incredible empathy for young children. Not so much for adults, you know, and I, I just think that we're we're wired somewhat differently. So, uh, how how's your personal experience with empathy? What do you see as maybe the obstacles to empathy? One of the obstacles you'd mentioned was judgment, and what do you see other obstacles? You know, things that kind of get in the way of of empathy. Well, I think it's really fascinating because when you shared about. I think you have four different types of empathy, and one of them was self-empathy. And for me, that's like the last one to kick in. And um, the obstacles to self-empathy, I would say, used to be, sometimes they rear their ugly heads, but would be perfectionism. 
you know, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you should have had that perfect or whatever. Um, definitely judgment. Um, and it, it may even be just not being mindful, you know, just being so busy multitasking that, that you miss those signs and opportunities to have that heart to heart connection. And um, one of the stories when empathy, self empathy kicked in for me was I um, was being interviewed for This Is America. And I was doing it in place of the founders there in Western Canada. I'm right near Washington, D.C. They're like, would you please go do this? I'm like, sure. So we're having this great interview and enthusiasm is one of my strength virtues. And then I start talking about Oprah and her interview with the, with the young women in her girls' school. Well, what you don't know is that Linda, the founder of the Virtues Project, was on Oprah probably about 13 years ago. And Oprah said of the Family Virtues Guide, actually, I'll show you. She said that this is the instruction manual that our kids didn't come with. And so I knew she knew the strategies, and I knew that Oprah knew how to speak the language. So I'm watching her um, special about the girls' school, and she's saying to these young women who get up at 4 o'clock in the morning to walk through these very violent neighborhoods just to get to school, she's saying, oh, you're such a good girl. You're such a good girl. And I'm screaming at the television going, Oprah, what's good? You know, like these girls had courage and determination and perseverance. And then I realized after my interview on the very long 45-minute metro ride home that I just dissed Oprah on national television, and now I'm doing it online. So, Oprah, humble apology, but it's just to illuminate a point. So I'm beating myself up all the way through, you know, on the ride home. I get to my house. I walk through my house. I go outside. I sit down. I look at the sky, and I'm like, dang, you had a lot of courage to go on TV, and you really had a lot of enthusiasm for the Virtues Project, but you probably could have been a little bit more discerning when you were talking about Oprah and maybe called on a little bit more tact. And what I realized at that moment, Edwin, was even though I had been speaking the language of the virtues and teaching it to other people for three years, that I still had the committee, that I would still say unkind things to myself and not use guidance to get me back on track. I would shame and blame myself. And it was at that moment that I realized that I now had a choice. That these virtues really were invitations for me to do things differently or affirmations of the way that I was living and sometimes both. And I have to say that I have been much more empathetic and gentle with myself being able to use the language of the virtues instead of just being judgmental, getting all perfectionistic with myself. Mm. It's been a real gift. So it's like the... The, uh, the the judgment and the, the uh, perfectionism kind of uh, dampens your own, or the self-judgment dampens your own empathy and kind of self-connection. And, and so with these virtues, you're, you're able to kind of, kind of get away from, from that to see other kind yeah. of qualities. And actually, we, we, this is the second time we've done this uh, interview. And the first time I'd really messed up with the audio and I was like, really saying, oh, how could I do that? You know, and so I was like really irritated with myself. And then you sent, I, I mentioned it to you and you sent me two uh, virtue cards. Uh, I think it was acceptance and I can't remember what the other one was. And right the now. other one was gentleness. gentleness. Gentleness, right. Be gentle. I really appreciate that. It was just, a, it was a nice way you could have the word say, oh, be gentle, uh, you know, have accept acceptance, but to have the card and all the other you know qualities around it, and have the graphics, it kind of added a, a lot. So oh, good. Well, yeah. I, I really, you know, I'm a big believer that things happen for a reason, and it was, and I really trust that the information in our exchange is going to be more meaningful for the people who watch it, and. Um, so it's all good. We've all, as a, as a technologist myself, we've all done that before, and. Um, so I really, really had incredible empathy for mm, you great. and sympathy as well. Sympathy so. too. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the other thing I was kind of like, what I was wondering about is what would a culture of empathy look like to you? Like you've, you've worked in the schools and, you know, what does, what would a, 
maybe what is the situation that is now in a lot of the schools mm -hmm. and what would a culture of empathy look like? How would people be interacting? What would be the tone and the flavor and the, the feeling of a school that had a high level of, of empathy? What a beautiful invitation for me to imagine. And it's not that it's not happening in schools. Um, a lot of the culture in the schools, at least in public education across the U.S. right now, is fear-based and competition. And it's not coming from the educators. And it's not coming from the students. It's really coming from business and policymakers that I believe have everyone's best interest at heart, but are going about things in a way that are not in alignment with my personal values. And so there's all this fear and competition rolling downhill. And there's all this academic focus on academic rigor and testing, 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 testing. And um, I just read Daniel Pink's new book called Drive. And, you know, he talks about motivation. But he talks about um, money as a motivator and that money as a motivator is only motivating when you're doing menial tasks. But when you're doing things that are a higher level, that's not what it's about. It's about mastery and purpose. And in education, what I think has happened is we've reduced it down to testing. And that's not a motivator. And it's certainly not meaningful. And um, when we can remember that these children that are in our care are noble beings, that we hold them up in the highest esteem, that that's when there's transformation can be made in education. And the same is true that the colleagues that we work with, it's not about, you know, us versus them. And if you go to the homepage of the Virtues Project, you'll, you'll see that the quote is humanity. There is no they, only us. And I think that, um, if the U.S. would use that as an approach to education, really to realize that as a first world, we have the responsibility to educate, and that is to bring forth, not to push into the heads of these kids, but to bring forth all the gifts that they have, because not only are we responsible for our own country, but we're a leader in the world. And we can make a huge difference in humanity. So when we start going, oh, well, we're number 20-something in math and 20-something in science and all these other countries are beating us, then that's the wrong way to go about it. If perhaps, you know, they still want to move up numerically, they called on empathy and said, wow, you know, I wonder what are they doing over there to create these um, students that are being so successful in the areas of math and science, then their own empathy might help them solve the problem in a more meaningful way. And so I think that's one with the policymakers. I also think that um, when we realize and we look at individuals, at our colleagues, at the families that we work with, at our students, from a place of love and empathy, then we can understand that when they're stressed out, there's something going on. And when we can make that relationship, heart-to-heart -heart connection, find out what it is, call in our empathy, then we single-handedly might be able to make a difference in that child's life, in that colleague's life. And even if it's just for the moment, but if we can understand what's going on with them, if we call in our empathy and we realize, oh my goodness, you know what? It's Monday morning. No wonder this kid's off his rocker. They don't have food. The only time that this child gets food is at school. And we just fed him sugar cereal with chocolate milk and a sticky bun for breakfast because that's what's being fed in some of our schools. No wonder he's off his chain. Or that this other person, you know, is just really sullen and weeping. Oh, you know what? She's with her dad on the weekend and she's back on her, at her mother's. And it's a hard transition. So when we have those relationships, especially in schools, I think that our, it's easier for our empathy to kick in. But we need to be really mindful of what's below the surface with those behaviors.
And the same is true with our colleagues. You know, everybody is committed to bringing their best game every day. You know, nobody wakes up and says, I want to have a crappy day and I want to hurt children and impact their learning and prevent them from having a meaningful life. You just don't go into education if that's your philosophy. And so if we can have empathy for our colleagues as well and just say, hey, you know, what's that look on your face? What's going on? Or do you need to talk? Then I think the, that empathy helps to strengthen the relationships and a lot of research shows that when we as colleagues connect, then we talk more about our students. We stay in problem-solving mode instead of, you know, negativity. And that's what can empower and increase student achievement. Yes, those are uh, a lot of uh, ideas for how the uh, we can improve the empathy level and kind of the, the benefits. Kind of the, it's kind of like seeing be below the surface of what's going on with with children or, and the colleagues and and uh, you know I kind of wonder it's it's like how 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 to make that uh, a conscious shift like Ashoka is doing it now it's like saying well we need empathy in the schools but somehow. It seems to me that there needs to be the intention there. You know, it's like we need to consciously create an environment that fosters and nurtures empathy in this school. And it kind of happens. Everybody has the empathy already built in. But it's like how to kind of consciously, you know, kind of work on on that that on that vision and and how do you create the intention for it? Yeah. And that's such a great question, and that's the work of the Virtues Project. And so by speaking the language, by, again, being able to witness the virtues in ourselves, in our children, and our colleagues, um, may I give you just an example of, of what that would look like? Yeah, so instead please. of saying, no, good job. So um, think about when you were four or a young child, and they're learning to tie their shoes. And they're, they're doing it, man. They're turning purple. There's beads of sweat coming down all over their face. And um, normally when we see them and they're working it, we normally say what to them? Good uh, job. Good job. Encouragement. Right? Uh -huh. Good job. Or you can do it or something like that. But what if we were to say, wow, I really see your determination in the way you're working to tie your shoes without giving up. Then they know, oh, determination means doing something hard without giving up. And then this four-year-old grows up, and they're now in first grade, and they're doing algebra because that's what we're doing to six-year-olds. And that child's working through that hard problem. Instead of saying, good job, we say, wow, I really see your determination in the way you're working through that hard problem without giving up. And then that child, second grade, third grade, goes off to college, get married, whatever, and something's really hard. But we're not there to acknowledge their determination. They know they have it in them. They're like, ooh, you know what determination means? Doing something hard. Staying in this marriage. You know, sticking to this job. You know, working through this college application without giving up. And I know that I have that determination in me. And I'm going to do it. And I think that empathy can kind of be somewhat of an overarching virtue here. Because when you have that empathy, you're able to be the witness of the virtue that's being exemplified and able to name it. Mm -hmm. So that's the first strategy. And, and this is how to create that culture of empathy and character in our schools. The second is recognizing teachable moments. So instead of um, shaming and blaming, again, it's using the language to just say, oh, you know what, the technology messed up, you know, in the future, maybe we just try, we do a test run, play, see whatever it was, what are the virtues that we can call in right now, acceptance, gentleness, whatever, and move on without any shame. The third strategy is setting clear boundaries based on restorative justice. And the first part is, um, well, fill in the blank for me. So rules are meant to be Broken. <laughs> Promises are meant to be. Kept. And so why do we all have class rules? 
Like, really? Makes no sense. So, in the Virtues Project, we have either uh, a class commitment, a class compact, or something, but it's not rules, a class promise. And instead of saying, we will walk with our hands and feet and objects to ourselves, we will raise our hand when we want to speak, it's all about the virtues. We will be respectful with our words and our actions. We will be enthusiastic learners and always work with excellence. And there are about four or five rules traditionally or commitments that we come up with that are virtues based so that whenever there's a mistaken behavior we can call somebody back to the virtue and it's not just um, specific to the classroom it's something that they can take out into the real world and then once there has been a mistaken behavior maybe somebody has hit somebody when they were angry it's using the restorative justice process which is a four-step process basically saying what happened giving the person who maybe harmed somebody the opportunity to tell their side of the story and then listen to the other person's side of the story without being interrupted and then calling them to a virtue so when I hear that you were really angry instead of punching your friend what virtue was missing. What virtue could you have called on? And perhaps it was peacefulness. So if you were to call on peacefulness instead of hitting your friend, what would you have done differently? Used my words, said that, you know, I don't like it when you say that. Okay, well, you know, in the future, what will that look like when you're being peaceful? And then and then they can give you the scenario. But you know what? There's already been harm. So how can you make amends? And the amends piece is so powerful because it's not just about making the other person who you've harmed feel better, but it's about making yourself feel whole and complete. And it's restoring the community. And imagine if instead of zero tolerance or just time out or suspending kids so that they're not in schools to learn, we actually used restorative justice, that school to prison pipeline that there's a whole bunch of media about now. You can just, cl my, my personal um, c hope is that we're going to close all these schools and make them institutions of learning because we're going to have empathy. Give we're going to acknowledge prisons. kids for their. I'm sorry? Close the uh, prisons. Oh, what did I say? Close the schools? <laughs> yeah, close the <laughs> prisons. Thank you. Thank you for um, your helpfulness. Correct me. Yeah, because we're going to be able to honor the inherent nobility of all of our children. We're going to keep them in schools because we're going to utilize restorative justice. I was just at a meeting with the um, Department of Justice and the Department of Education here in D.C. last Friday. And they, they want to know, like, how can we stop the school to prison pipeline? Oh. Well, you know, empathy is a really good start. And then the fourth strategy of the Virtues Project is honoring the spirit. It's that meaning and purpose. Let's stop filling in just that bu those bubbles. Let's do some service learning. Let's put our empathy into practice. And then the last strategy is the companioning process. It's a seven-step counseling technique to listen somebody into their own solution. And um, in the Virtues Project, we say we wear, wear our shield of compassion and detachment and I would say empathy as well, because empathy and compassion are very similar. Um, I think empathy is being able to put ourselves into another person's shoes. And compassion is, again, having that feeling, but knowing, you know, it, it's more, it, it's more of your heart is evoked. And your compassion comes out often when you see someone in pain. Empathy, there doesn't need to be a whole lot of pain. And, and yeah, so well, I don't know what what. How do you see compassion and empathy being similar, or different? Um, yeah. It, before we get to that, um, you know, you've uh, you started off uh, your explanation by it sounded like you were saying that we need to get away from judgments, good or bad, and then you kind of went into a series of of processes that it seems to be it's really these processes for being more articulate about what our feelings are is a way of, of and being more, yeah, I guess, I'm, I guess I'm trying to just really kind of get what it is that you were saying. So it's like yeah, get so away I from positive, negative judgments and be more articulate about uh, what, what we're about feeling that. and how, how the feelings work and how to foster them or. And, and beyond, 
in part and beyond the feelings because feelings are a piece of it, but it's really the virtues. The it's virtues. A, uh, there's yeah. qualities of character because, um, you know, excellence, diligence, determination, empathy, compassion, love, kindness, responsibility, respect. And um, there, there are two basically strands of virtues or character. And Tom Lacona, who's the grandfather of character education, he basically says there's performance character and there's moral character. And so performance character is the diligence, the determination, the excellence. The moral character is the compassion, the empathy, the kindness. And if we look throughout history, there are some leaders who had a whole lot of performance character but was missing a whole lot of moral character. And he killed millions and millions of people. Any guesses who I'm talking about? Um, I'm not sure. It's... So Hitler. Oh, Hitler. So I was going to say that, but I didn't know that. his performance character going on. But, you know, and imagine if he had called on empathy, compassion, humanity, tolerance, unity, all the things that he could have done. Now, if we look back a few years ago with what happened to Enron, they had a whole lot of performance character. Mm. They didn't have a whole lot of moral character. We need to be balanced. And I'm not saying that this is the whole touchy-feely stuff because I wouldn't want to go to a brain surgeon who was really sweet and had it so going on on the moral side, but his excellence or her excellence factor didn't have it going on. So I really think that we need to be both. And we also need to... Um, Think about balancing our own unique strength virtues and our growth virtues. So if we only operated from a place of empathy without sometimes calling on perhaps detachment or discernment, we may never get anything done that we needed to do. You know, and for me, if what, compassion is one of my strength virtues, and I live in Washington, D.C., and there's just a lot of hard stuff here. You know, I bring food with me where I go in my car because I don't want to give out money because I'm never sure where it's going to be used for homeless people. But I do, it just breaks my heart. And I know that regardless of their situation, my situation is a million times better. So, I will often give them food. Um, I definitely have conversations. I go out to breakfast with them. I stop, I talk with them, and that's my compassion. But if I also didn't have some detachment, I would probably sell my house and give it to them. I always want to invite them home for Thanksgiving dinner, and my husband's like, but honey, they're strangers. Like, you just don't know what's going to happen. I'm like, no, 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 no. I know them. Like, we're friends. And so we really need to balance our virtues. Yeah, so you're you're talking about uh, compassion and the uh, uh, kind of definition. I, I've seen compassion as empathy applied to suffering. Uh, we talked mm -hmm. earlier, I mean, previously about the definition of empathy. I mean, the one that I use is empathy is uh, there is self empathy, and that's kind of mindfulness, sensory awareness of what's going on within ourselves. There is mirrored empathy, which is through mirror neurons. So, as, you know, you're shaking your head. I'm feeling, I'm, I'm feeling, and you're seeing this. You're kind of, your body is mirroring my, you know, hand movements. Right. And, and we're kind of feeling the energy from each. I can feel your energy, you know, your, your high energy level you know, enthusiasm by, you know, it's kind of mirrored within myself. Well, I'm mirroring it back from you. So, you know, <laughs> is that it? Yeah, <laughs> enthusiasm. And then, uh, then we have uh, imaginative empathy is, which is kind of perspective taking. Like, it's like those, you're talking about the maybe children coming to class and they're acting a certain way and knowing why it is. While they've been eating this food, they've had this sit back situation. And so it's more of a cognitive, you know, uh, approach. And then there's finally is empathic action that having made this connection, you know, self empathy, mirrored empathy, cognitive empathy, is that you take the like the appropriate action, uh, perhaps with those children, is you know you you change the diet, uh, you you know you change you do these things that are going to improve the situation. Now for me. Uh, is is and I've asked you know some of the you know big academic experts about uh, compassion and and they were and 
they've kind of agreed that com is compassion is empathy applied to suffering. Mm. And so it's, it's like, uh, you know, I can see your energy and I don't see a lot of suffering in you right now. So I would not say I'm having a huge amount of compassion. But if suddenly if I see you in distress and I feel you, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Very well done. I feel you, you know, your distress. Then I say, oh, you know, I'm kind of this extra sense of presence. And how does that empathy kind of relate? Maybe I want to alleviate your suffering and, you know, do something. Uh, so it, it's very parallel to empathy. You know, there's, there's studies now about self-compassion and, you know, that uh, Kristen Neff, kind of the work that she does. And I, I see it as just a parallel process to empathy, but just applied to pain and suffering. So yeah, you know that's interesting because um, the Dalai Lama actually endorsed the Virtues Project, and I'm wondering what the Dalai Lama would say because I'm not so sure that he sees compassion just in the light of suffering. Hmm. Um, well, I can tell you, I I interviewed um, Paul Ekman, who's had about forty hours of dialogue. Uh, with the Dalai Lama and his definition of, of compassion was actually one of them that I was just uh, uh, using. So he's, he's actually, he, ha he was having these dialogues around uh, compassion with the Dalai Lama and he said to look at compassion he needed to study empathy and mm -hmm. he, he saw empathy, compassion as a slice of of the uh, of the empathy spectrum, so yeah, um, and and actually, so here's the quote on the back of the compassion card for the Virtues Project from the Dalai Lama, and he says, "If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion." And uh, here's compassion is deep empathy for another who is suffering or living with misfortune there you go yeah so did the dalai lama say that or is that your the no card? that's the virtues card okay. and then it goes on to say it is understanding and caring and a strong desire to ease their distress yeah. compassion flows freely from our hearts when we let go of judgments and seek to understand our compassionate presence helps people to know they are not alone Sometimes they don't need us to fix anything. They only need to be heard with compassion so that they can connect to their own inner wisdom. We need our own compassion as much as others do, as you were sharing about empathy. Whether a silent prayer or a gentle touch, compassion is a priceless gift. So there you go. Yeah. It, it's empathy applied to suffering. Yeah. And there's something, uh, it is my mother always talks, she was always trying to get me to get, be mar you know, get married and I never got married. But she said, um, is joys shared or joys doubled? Mm. Uh, sorrows shared or sorrows halved? Yes. Right? So that's kind of like, that's really about empathy because it's like as we have a relationship and we empathize with each other and I feel your enthusiasm and your joy, you know, it's like it accentuates, it kind of builds as we, you know, it kind of doubles. Doing it together kind of doubles it from through the empathy. Whereas if you're in pain and suffering, that presence that, you know, someone else being there, not feeling alone, uh, you know, it, it, it diminishes just that presence uh, diminishes the, the pain. And I mean, there's all kinds of scientific, you know, explanations for that because, you know, about oxytocin, how mm -hmm. as we empathize, how we have compassion, oxytocin is released in our body. And oxytocin uh, is something that, uh, uh, counteracts cortisol and you know those stress uh, uh, hormones and chemicals. So there's real physiological things that happen within our body that uh, is kind of like I mean there's sort of scientific explanation. It's not just you know theory you know kumbaya. There's real physiological yeah. stuff that's happening. Absolutely, and that's really helpful to know. So now I get why I have like double doses of compassion because I need that oxytocin to balance out the cortisol, the, all that stuff that I have. So, okay, so the compassion is not such a bad thing. You know, sometimes it's just hard to be me because I have so much compassion. I feel like my heart's breaking all the time. But um, what you're saying is it, it's actually very good for me to have that too. Yeah, so, to have that, yes, that compassion. It, it's, well, there's other, I mean, it's like, uh, 
I mean, I, I don't know if, if sympathy is one of your cards, but, uh, you know, sometimes people see uh, empathy as, you know, kind of being present with someone and you're seeing their presence. And then if I see you in distress, then if I become, you know, kind of sorrowful and distressed myself, that's kind of seen as like a secondary uh, feeling and would be maybe more like sympathy, you know? So right. some people are just very good at being present. They don't take on, you know, the pain and suffering is- Detachment. Yeah, it's, it, it's I, don't know, there's a, I know there's a, the word detachment, but I don't see it as detachment. Um, I see it actually as, as empathy in you're you're totally present detachment is cutting off empathy right it's like not not in know. our definition mm, okay. not in our definition okay so let me may i share one more yeah, reading please yeah it's... and tell me if this resonates with you detachment is experiencing our feelings without allowing them to control us we step back and look at things objectively we let go and accept what we cannot change. We detach from others' choices, knowing that their spiritual work is not ours to do. We choose how we will act rather than just reacting. We step away from harmful cravings. Detachment is a deep breath of peace and patience in response to unexpected anger. We can listen without losing ourselves. With detachment, we see our mistakes honestly, make amends, and start afresh. Detachment allows us to be in the world, but not of it. It frees us to lead our lives with grace. Yeah, well, I'm still learning. So, I don't so how's that definition for you? <clears throat> I, I, there's, uh, there's some nuances there that I'm trying to uh, figure out uh, still, in the sense that you can detach from someone like right you're in an argument or 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 you don't like them and you detach right you 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 create the detachment creates a wall between you and the other person and then that can be it's what that that can, that can be. be yeah that, that can be an example of detachment however when you're in a place of empathy when you're when you're balancing out empathy and detachment what you're doing is sh you're saying okay you know what i know that he's saying all this stuff because he's really stressed out about something and the detachment piece comes in it's not about me i'm not i don't need to be upset or get angry because i know that i just happen to be the person in the room that i'm getting misdirected anger so applying detachment here along with empathy helps me to be there for you, but not, not deflect and not make the situation worse because I'm not taking it personally. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I see that. Um, there's, a, there's a quality for me. It, it's about presence, right? There's, I mean, mm -hmm. ideally for myself, if I'm in a situation, I would like to be present for the person and... Uh, and so I see presence as not detachment, but it's, it's not, the presence is not kind of becoming, um, kind of overwhelmed with all the feelings and, and, you know, stresses and whatever. It's like remaining, uh, you know, that mindfulness remaining, uh, calm. Neutral. Uh, I have trouble with, okay, with, maybe not neutral. Uh -huh. Because, see, it's like there's this, it can, detachment, if it has two meanings of, you know, I'm just detaching, putting up a wall versus uh, it's like not getting involved, being present and feeling what the person is feeling and acknowledging it and being there with it, but not um, being kind of consumed and having those secondary fear and all that kind of, that mm -hmm. kind of can come up. So... I kind of struggle with this a little bit. I'm still trying to work it out and I'm not totally articulate, I feel, you know. About no, no, I, I appreciate where you're coming from and I think that we're really saying similar things. Um, traditionally, the word detachment brings a lot of baggage with it um, because people think it means being, you know, um, removed from, cut off and things of that nature as you've described. For our purposes as a virtue and how it's applied in cultures, oral traditions, and sacred texts of the world, it's a way to be present for somebody, being mindful that when buttons are pushed, 
that's you know that's not what that's about um so that you're you're not going to get your place into a reactive mode yeah. so that you can be there to respond it, it's a virtue that allows you to respond um so for example I, I was doing some work with somebody and they just cannot stand the word educator or teacher. Like, no, you're a speaker. Why would you want to call yourself an educator? That brings just such horrible things to it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, to me, that's who I am. That's my favorite thing in the world. That's the highest compliment. Like, I, please. And um, I was starting to get defensive. And what I realized was when I could call on detachment and take a step back and empathy was, oh, clearly this guy did not have such a good uh, experience in traditional school. And, it, and I really needed to detach because if I didn't, it would have been delete never to continue the conversation. But we were able to really work through things because I had empathy from where he was coming from and I didn't take it personally. Yeah, I think that it, we're saying the same thing. It's that, uh, you know, it just did it. it uh, there's kind of a nuance between different types of detachment. You know, so it, it, it can be used differently. And, it, and the way you're talking about it is, is a way that fosters. It's, it's a type of detachment that actually fosters connection. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so. And, and really, there are so many definitions for so many different oh, words. Oh, yeah. That's why these cards are really helpful, not just to look at the word, but to read it. I um, was working on some materials yesterday, and for many, many years, I've thought, we as educators need to start a revolution. And I'm like, I can't say that we're starting a revolution, because that's like bloodshed and war. But I'm like... No, like really, we need to like take back our schools and our classrooms and our profession in a revolution. And then I decided to go to Webster. And the second definition was all about blood and war and killing. But the first definition was, you know, those people, you know, taking back, taking over an institution that they're in and doing it in a different way that's better for the people. Mm. And that's the revolution that I'm committed to, you know, putting out there. <laughs> Let's have an empathy revolution. <laughs> I'm all for that. <laughs> that is great. Well, I know we, we're sort of going to talk for about an hour, and I, we've kind of come to that point, and I think this is like a perfect place to uh, bring the conversation <laughs> to, to an end with the empathy revolution. That's great. <laughs> well, it, again, it has been a joy um, to, to connect with you, and I'm grateful for your commitment to spreading the word of empathy and your openness to hearing, you know, about my perspective, the work of the Virtues Project, and if I can support you or anybody out there, you know, that's my joy. I love doing the workshops. I love doing the keynotes. I just love sharing this work, and virtuesproject.org has incredible resources for you to bring empathy into not just your classrooms, but into your personal lives and to change the culture of your schools and um, if you haven't yet submitted your idea for the um, change makers teaching what matters empathy campaign do it because you have a couple more weeks and that's how we connected right that's how we connected to the Ashoka site yeah that's great so I'm so grateful to them for having set that up and I think it's going to lead to a lot of connections like this and I'm so glad I just enjoy talking to you so much I'm so and especially exploring these nuances of, of the words. And I think that's what the, uh, the virtues, you know, cards really help to kind of stimulate that conversation and that, yeah, that exploration. So uh, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll talk again. So thank you. Absolutely. Have a beautiful day and um, to be continued. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. 